<laughs> this is the OGM weekly check-in call for Thursday, May 12th, 2022. Um, it is another day. Mr. Homer, nice to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you too. Um, I, uh, the last couple of years have been really traumatic for lots of folk in ways that I think are not being acknowledged that much right now as we busy try to get re-entry and try to renormalize and try to whatever. And that just keeps popping up in my head. It's been a, it's been a, a hard time and it's been a harder time for a bunch of people who hit a big bump in the road somewhere along the way. And I just kind of want to acknowledge that. And it's made difficult because I think we expect it might get worse. Yes. And, and there's, a, there's a sense of, of impending doom kind of that, that uh, pervades many of our calls, um, but that is not unrealistic. So. And I think that there's an interesting news cycle which really does ongoing limbic hijack. So like every week, there's something that you're supposed to be outraged about and the press really brings that to the top. And it seems in, you know, like they're generally, like sometimes it's something really important, but generally they're topics that probably could be fairly easy to compromise on, but they're brought to the fore and made very highly divisive, even when they aren't very divisive, which is, so I think that also puts on this, um, in this, this sense of doom and the sense of trauma, like just keeping the trauma alive. Um, I just, uh, <clears throat> as a small kind of light pointer on that, the CNN's Chiron that's always breaking, like always breaking, like this just broke, this just broke, it's really important. It's like, no, seriously. And, and we now take 24 hour news for granted, it used to not be that way. And then before TV, it used to be, you know, the newspaper came out and there were, there were morning dailies and evening dailies and they had different news because they managed to put, you know, a couple of bits of lead in line together at the right time and get it out the door. And, Ronald, and, and in his early career, Ronald Reagan was a radio announcer for baseball games, reading a ticker tape of the baseball games. Like, like, and pretending like he was watching the game. That's pretty good. That's sort of what he did for the economy. Sorry, Grace, go ahead. I was going to say that. A, there was a very funny sketch, an Israeli sketch about, uh, like, it was in the 90s about, like, people who were addicted to the news. It was like this rehab center. And, you know, like, they found this little scrap of newspaper and they're all, you know, like, so this, it was considered an addiction quite a long time ago by Israelis. Love Walter Cronkite's closing line was always, and that's the way it is, except on his last broadcast, after he said, that's the way it is, the mic went off, he said, except it's not, that's not the way it is. And it have, <laughs> never has been the way it is. Um, news reports on the froth on the top of the water, not the deep currents going on. I think, I think that we're, we're suffering two pandemics, high drama and stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I've, I've said for a long time, we've been in a, an epidemic of not listening. Like we're just not listening to each other and we're, we're becoming more inured to each other's sort of pain and woes and there's too much to deal with and so on and so forth. And so we're not accustomed to actually hearing. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I wasn't listening. Yeah, <laughs> what? exactly. What? Hey, what? <laughs> um, so in this, Spirit of uh, our weekly check-in call. Let's go, um, Kevin, Ken, Doug. Well, hey, thank you. Um, I'm sort of re-emerging. We had a conference, it was labs. We set it up as small labs of a dozen because we were afraid of COVID and we could thought that a bubble of a dozen could be safe if we couldn't meet together. And so we made it smaller and you know, it has about 120 people. And what we discovered is that with a bunch of these things, the things we're working on, which are platforms to create market power for those who don't typically have it around real estate or entrepreneurship and business ownership, or uh, actually a new crazy one around municipal bonds. Um, it's really complex and they need a simplified story. And 
they, you can get a, a safe return doing this, or you can cut the costs of the light bills at the BIPOC school, as you know, uh, the, the, the HBCUs, uh, et cetera. So uh, we might becoming the simplifying front folks for two or three categories. And I've done that before in internet marketplaces where, let me go briefly into neighborhood investment trust. That's neighbors investing in neighbors to stop black Wall Streets from being displaced by predatory hedge funds. And we had about six different ones from Kansas City and Charlotte, I mean, uh, Chicago and New and uh, Baltimore and Seattle and uh, Crenshaw, LA and uh, Atlanta, and they're all doing it slightly differently, which is really encouraging. It means there's a lot of ways to do it. And so, you know, it was a lot like uh, Havana uh, cabs in the middle of the highway sharing parts and figuring out what part you've built that makes this worth we can use and stuff. And then, you know, they, they did this crazy thing. We had an endowment track, church endowments, like somebody leaves behind, you know, when we worked in Cincinnati, we worked with the church that had the proctor money and the Methodist got the gamble money. And so here it's Lilly money. That's so they're now wanting to move that money toward what their mission is as opposed to seeing it as frozen. So the neighborhood investment trust kind of came into the endowments track, people trying to understand how to move their money and said, look, we've got a plan. Why don't you give us the money? And um, and then two of the endowments actually do have some money to move. So they're starting to move things, but they have relational power. So it's a real strange, uh, you know, unlikely allies being discovered. And so we'll, we might be out in front of some things. There's no need for a lab. It's, it's pretty simple. But within three things that can make a big difference, there, there's a need for us to maybe be the, the you know, the, the one out in front of the parade. So that's, that's a, something we're exploring. It's kind of cool. Did you find that the group size, small, I think you said you, it was a smaller group size than usual because COVID, because whatever, did you find that the smaller group size helped a bunch in the conversation? Oh yeah, it, we could not have done this event at 300. Um, so we have to decide if we want real intense groups, you know, that meet six times ahead of time and that I do lots of curation with every single one of them. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a, it's intensive, but it really works. And then they came out with like, and we want to take over the world doing this. You know, so uh, there were three groups. That were, I mean, a crazy thing that was discovered by this woman who got all the uh, half a dozen HBCUs and 20 black towns mini bonds together. And she discovered that they're paying more for their bonds, for their cost of capital, for their street lights and their plumbing. And nobody knew it. Wow. They were just the consultants kept them in the dark. And so now they realize, oh, we have some collective power and we've never defaulted. Like, what the fuck? Why are you selling our bonds at 85 cents on the dollar? And why is our interest rate twice of what a white, you know, Georgetown pays half as much for its capital as, as Howard. And Howard's never defaulted on its bonds in 100 years, but nobody knew it was there. So then it's like, holy crap, we need to all look at this and, you know, march on your local municipality, et cetera. So that was kind of cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a lot of ways in which just simply comparing notes um, on things like, you know, interest rates and penalties and whatever else can, can lead to some big solutions. Um, uh, we're in a condo that has a water tower on it. It's one of the last remaining water towers in this Pearl District, which is the icon for the Pearl District is the water tower. They're pretty much all going to go away and ours probably needs to be torn down because it's a, it has become a healthy, uh, a health risk, a safety hazard, but also rebuilding it's really expensive but there's microwave towers microwave uh, repeaters there's cell basically um, uh, gear on the tower and i have not been able to make my way down to the bottom of this but somebody has an easement that th the money for the microwave towers is not coming to the hoa it's coming to somebody who got a deal somewhere and i can't discover like what it is somebody like hijacked a revenue flow that should be like helping the building and it's not. And I imagine things like this are just everywhere, like tucked away in the corners all over the place, in particular in places where people don't have a lot of knowledge uh, or expertise and there was an asset to be had and to be taken. So, so it'd, it'd be nice to sort of go around with a little vacuum, little hand vacuum and, and, and clean these things up around the, around the globe. Um, thanks, Kevin. Let's go Ken, Doug, Pete. 
Hello, everybody. Good to see your faces. Uh, I don't know that I've done anything particularly OGME in the last couple of weeks. Um, I've just been working. Uh, I've got a bunch of coaching clients that I'm working with. Um, I'm keeping up with uh, reading the dawn of everything. I finished Sand Talk. There is one thing that, that's kind of on my mind. In Sand Talk, uh, Tyson talks about five different kinds of mind. Um, kinship mind, um, which is recognizing that nothing exists outside of a relationship to something else. Um, what I love is this. He says, an observer does not try to be objective, but is integrated with a sentient system that is observing itself. That was a really profound um, sentence for me to read. Uh, story mind about finding narratives and memories and knowledge transmission. It's really powerful for memorizing and, and connecting meaningful to place. Um, dreaming mind, which is about using metaphors to work with knowledge. Um, ancestor mind, which is the one that's really on my mind, which is about deep engagement, connecting with a timeless state of mind or alpha wave state, optimal learning. Um, we can reach it through Aboriginal culture activities. It's characterized by complete concentration, engagement, losing track of linear time, um, and pattern mind, uh, seeing patterns and trends. So the ancestor mind has my attention right now because I think that we're not going to be able to work our way through a lot of the messes we're in without ancestor mind that we have to step into a different kind of imaginal space um the 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 ways in which we tend to um work on things tend to be reductionistic and and engineering based and i think we have to collectively step into step outside of our minds into ancestor mind there's tr there's something some kind of sphere around the the earth from which all of our knowledge derives you know music is in there math is in there people have certain certain people can come along and they they pull stuff down um mozart was famous for saying you know he'd wake up with all this music and the challenge was not to step on it you know to get it down before he woke up before he started walking around and so i think there there's the the a, a significant portion of the solutions that we are looking for exist outside of our ways of thinking about them. And my my quest right now is how do we arrange ourselves in um, groups to tap into that because it's so needed. So that's that's my OGME thought for the day. Um, thank you. Um, could you repeat the five? I, I can actually put them into the, the and chat. Pete, and Pete just got them as well. If you want to just double check Pete's list, that'd be great. Do you have a picture of them, Ken? I, I have this. I, I copied them out of the book, so I have I have five paragraphs. I'm happy to put in the chat. I think Pete just put them in there or something. Yeah, I, I'll I'll put them in the chat one paragraph at a time because let me paste everything in, and then you can see the whole thing. That and this is just he has a chapter on each one, but this is just the highlights of them. Cool. And I can't recommend Sand Talk highly enough. I really really got a lot from that book. Thank you. I have to go back into it, and 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 there's just the like a cue, right? And and book club and other so book circle and other things like it are a really nice way for us to pre-digest some of these things and then realize where we need to go, sort of mellow, marinate in in different parts of it. Um, let's go, Doug, Pete, Grace. I'm thinking about the all the little contracts that Jerry mentioned that are hidden from us that are all over the place. And the problem for society is the people that own those contracts want to keep them going. So it's a glue that keeps society from changing. And we've woven this inter incredible interweaving of relationships uh, that keep us from being able to move to a new place. Uh, the new place that's on my mind right now is uh, as our ship is sinking, it might be smart to spend our money not on trying to repair the ship, but on building lifeboats. Uh, some kind of monastic uh, uh, taking areas and trying to make them into livable places in ways that could be copied by other people. Uh, that seems like a, a place that we've just got to go to. And as things fall apart, uh, people will try and put it together in some kind of workable situations. So that's what I'm thinking. Um, thanks, Doug. This is maybe a little bit of a tangent, but it, it, um, there's a really interesting book by John Stilgo, a Harvard historian titled Lifeboat. And he says, nobody would really done a history of lifeboats, so here we go. 
And it turns out that a life, by, whoever ends up in a lifeboat when there's an emergency, that's like a small world all of its own. There's a bunch of stuff about gear and methods. <clears throat> and it turns out they, the lifeboat design and David design to get the lifeboat off the ship that's sinking was terrible for a very long time. Um, but then there's this thing that when the age of sail ends and steam travel begins, the nature of who's on the lifeboat changes dramatically because before that era, pretty much everybody on the lifeboat probably knows the prevailing winds, currents, what to do. Uh, if you see an island go by, whether to try to go, whether to try to get to it or not, all that kind of stuff, uh, signals of land nearby, all seamanship is basically pervasive. The moment you get steamships and you can drive your, your boat around like a taxi, like a bus on the waters, the, the level of seamanship just really dramatically declines and your survivability declines because uh, you, you don't no longer have on board ship the people needed to do it. And so analogously, if we want to build lifeboats for the coming crises and all that, what are the kinds of skills we want to have on board? How do we want to have them on board? What do we want to do uh, when it's not a lifeboat in the ocean, although we may be living on the waters more than we Yeah, can it's a real wish. problem that nobody on the lifeboat is willing to kill a chicken. Or knows how to clean a chicken, probably, or whatever. Or wants to pluck it. Or wants to pluck it. What the pluck? The other, the other thing that occurs to me that we might want to build is libraries that aren't just digital, right? That some of this knowledge wouldn't just disappear with us. And we're actually doing the exact opposite. Digitizing everything so that it will not survive all kinds of disasters. And so that feels to me also really important. Totally agree. Um, anybody else with thoughts on that? Let's go and, and Grace, I'll put you in line whenever you wind up sitting. So, but right now I've got Pete, Grace, Klaus. KJ, hi all. Um, <clears throat> I've been having a, uh, it's been a busy time, fun, fun mostly time, um, working on the Donna of Everything Book Club, uh, a, kind of an idea called harvesting, composting. We, I've talked before about harvesting and composting and uh, me and some of the other folks have been talking about that a little bit more. I'm, I'm thinking uh, I'd like to set up a little guild of practitioners of harvesting and composting meetings like this. Um, kind of related to that, Wendy Elford and I have a big project. Um, it's mostly Wendy's work, um, helping her with the web stuff, but she's um, have the pleasure and the privilege and the um, and the, the hard work of uh, kind of digesting four yarns, they're called. Uh, yarning is a mm -hmm. uh, Australian Aboriginal practice of, of talking in kind of a, a circle group thing. Um, and Tyson Yunkaporta and uh, Dave Snowden and a few other people participated in this series of yarns. And Wendy's got the, again, the privilege and pleasure of sorting through the, the transcripts carefully, line by line, um, sentence by sentence, and picking out the, the gold bits and kind of assembling those into a, a, a database of stuff that we're going to be putting on websites. Um, so uh, it's fun watching her get to do that, um, even though she <laughs> mostly I hear her, you know, after a long day, it's like, wow, you know, and now I'm on, on hour two finally, you know. Um, uh, Meta Project Lionsburg uh, seems to be going well. It's picking up steam and, and uh, momentum. Um, uh, we've been, the, we, I, I don't know if we is the right pronoun there. Um, uh, it, uh, us, they um, have been, you know, making uh, silly beginner mistakes uh, and also a good deal of progress. And uh, it feels really energetic and active and interesting. Um, you might, if, uh, if you're on Mattermost, you might check out uh, Lionsburg Town Square, the channel is called, and then there's meetings uh, Wednesdays uh, at um, 1230 Pacific. Um, uh, uh, yesterday, um, yesterday, my wife Joanne was in a bit of a funk because she's like, I don't hear men being upset about um, the, uh, the abortion rights issue and the Supreme Court draft decision. Um, and I replied to, to Grace uh, about her comment um, in, in email, in the email list. 
separately kind of, but she, she made a good point. I don't hear men being up in arms about this. I don't hear men storming the, you know, storming the castle and going, okay, this, this cannot stand. Um, and I did something kind of dumb um, or reactive. I, I was wanting to get to a meeting or something like that. And I said, yeah, I, I ended up doing, yeah, but I didn't mean it to be, yeah, but it's like, yeah, but there's climate change and there's soil health and there's, you know, water and <laughs> everything's effed, you know? Um, so I got to sit with that for a while on my call and then go back to her and talk, you know, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to blow you off. You know, it's been something that's been weighing heavily on my mind. That whole week was destroyed for me. She and I hadn't really talked about it, but I, I was, you know, just like, like, I, I can't believe where we live and why this is happening. And, and we're taking, you know, we're, we're trashing, we're, we're taking bodily autonomy away from people, you know, many people. Um, uh, so anyway, um, I, I'm upset. I, I don't say much about it. Um, uh, I guess I'm upset about a number of things that I don't say much about. Uh, I've learned not to say much about it because it doesn't feel like we can make much difference, which is kind of maybe the wrong, wrong way to do it. I, my rationalization is that I'm kind of working on a better life for my great grandkids or something like that um and folks of that era uh, you know so I, I work on meta stuff and making the world a better place and making it so structural um, power imbalances aren't aren't working against us and things like that but the fruits of those labors won't pay off in my lifetime or my wife's lifetime so um so i guess i want to be a little bit more heard about the things i'm upset about now too thanks um Thanks, Pete. Um, I love that question and was wondering something similar. I mean, um, after George Floyd, there were Black Lives Matters protests in the streets for a very long time. And I live in Portland, there were protests in the streets and people trying to burn down the federal courthouse downtown and a bunch of other sorts of things as a result. And uh, well, you know, well through the pandemic. And this has not provoked the same kind of reaction. Um, and it's life-threatening also uh, in, a, in a huge and pervasive way. Um, I don't, does anybody else wanna, wanna pitch in on this? Yeah, I think with regard to most men, I'm not gonna say all men, but most men, throughout history, pregnancy has been a woman's problem. You know, like, oh, you're pregnant? Oh, too bad, gee, deal with it, right? And I think that attitude um, cascades over into this. I mean, I don't think most most men even know what ha what was going on before Roe, where, you know, every year tens of thousands of women would be maimed and 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 um, die from back room back alley abortions. I mean, it was a really fucking horrible thing. And then there's that's the the personal health side. Then there's the fact that this is a this is definitely an inequality, a social and gender inequality, where, you know women and it falls especially on poor women because rich women can always afford to find the doc, you know a, a well-connected doctor but poor women they end up you know um really fucked in this thing in more ways than one uh they lose the access to their own bodies they don't have control over over their um ability to decide what's going to happen um i think it was heather cox richardson who talked about um marital rape that there's still like 17 states that say marital rape is different than other rape and it's much more lenient that a, a woman oh yeah it was Ali, it was um alito's um citing of of hail there you know that a woman can't be raped by her husband because the contract says that she belongs to her husband so this is really fucking outrageous and um i'm stunned that more men are not picking this up and realizing these are our wives our sisters our daughters that we're we're ruling over their bodies in ways that do not give them autonomy. And what the fuck kind of democracy is that? And, and I don't know whether it's alarmism or a sober description of, of what's happening, but the knock-on effects, let's say Roe is, is disabled and then trigger laws, trigger, et cetera, et cetera. But then contraception could be illegalized and a whole series of, like, a whole series of other things, things seem to be on the table. Um, as at risk, which are thoroughgoing and pervasive, which the majority of the American population disagrees with pretty strongly. 
So there's kind of minority rule and, and, and a whole bunch of other things uh, that seem to be in place here to create a Christian state of some sort. Um, so Grace, then Pete. So I guess, I mean, I see the, the Roe versus Wade thing and all is, is sort of symptomatic of everything that's happening in the United States, right? This just complete collapse and radicalization of things that should, you should find a compromise about it, right? I, I come from Israel and it, it, I mean, I lived 27 years in Israel and we have a law against abortion, of course, because the religious laws say that and you need to get a medical excuse for it. And everyone I know who's ever gotten pregnant and wanted to get a medical excuse from their doctor gets a medical excuse from their doctor. And it's a non-issue. It just never shows up in the news. And you could say, oh, it's not democratic and women's bodies and whatever, but it's a non-issue because we found a way to just, you know, like, let's put that on, that is not the central issue to our country. And let's find a compromise. We can all turn a blind eye to the fact that anybody who wants abortion can get an abortion no matter where they come from. And you can just go to a doctor in the next city over and it's no problem. And so it's, it, I think there's this radicalization underneath all of this, you know, and I mentioned the, um, you know, like the, the, the leaking of documents. It, it, and again, that goes with what I said at the beginning, like every week they make sure there's something for us to talk about. So I'm wondering how much, you know, like there's leaking of documents by some force that's trying to, or, you know, whatever, trying to, like, I don't believe in conspiracy theory, but there's certainly enough people who, you know, throwing a wrench in the spokes every now and again, or every week is a good idea for them. Or whether, you know, this, this problem of deliberation or whatever, but again, I go, I think, I think that it just all goes back to what Doug said is like, we really need to be building lifeboats and not trying to fix this mess. And I've been working, thinking a lot about that on like, how do we create not just lifeboats, but also the, 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 you know, the connectivity between lifeboats and sort of that, that'll be more in my check-in, but I just feel like we get so focused on these symptoms. And to Pete's point, it's like every bit of energy that I spend worrying about this, and I do have a woman's body and I have had an abortion like many, many people when I was, you know, 17. And, you know, it's, it's an issue, right? Like it's, it's viscerally important to me, but every minute that I spend on that, I'm not spending on dealing with the infrastructure, which is, Unless we fix that, none of this is going to get better. It'll just be the next thing next week. Thanks, Grace. Pete? Um, thanks, Grace. I, and I think radicalization, um, Joanne also has a, a she, she, you know, like the sentence or two after being teary about, her, she worries, um, my daughter's in-laws are, are in Texas. So she's gonna go visit people in Texas. So she can end up in the situation where she's pregnant, doesn't know it has a miscarriage, ends up at the doctor's uh, office and you know, ends up in, in court um, deciding whether or not she's committed a crime, right? Um, so it, it's top of mind with my, my wife and she gets really upset about it, as do I. Um, Right after that, she's like, and of course, all this radical radicalization bullshit, I think, is probably the rich, you know, white capitalist bastard billionaires um, trying to keep us distracted, you know, from um, raping and pillaging, you know, the the economy. Um, the, the Mother Jones series of articles I, I put in the chat is, it's like, <laughs> oh my God, you know. Um, so... Uh, radicalization is a big part of the problem and and then using something like this as a you know as a as a pawn in in the, the game of capitalism is really fucked up um I, I wanted to say also that um uh that abortion isn't just a like uh isn't isn't necessary or, or abortion the things that are called abortion uh, include ectopic pregnancies and a miscarriage where you need a DNC and stuff like that. 10 or 20% of pregnancy, all pregnancies end up in a miscarriage. Um, some miscarriages, you need a DNC. A DNC gets coded medically as an abortion. And, you know, so you can go to jail. And women around the world have been going to jail for 10, 20, 30 years for a homicide because they had a miscarriage that wasn't their fault, right? So, 
the the and the way that the the trigger laws and things like that look like they're set up a lot of them it's legislators deciding kind of you know de novo out of their mind just like deciding that pi uh, the numerical value of pi is going to be three and a quarter because that's easier for everybody <laughs> it's like they're doing the same thing except for for bodily health right right now it's women um but you know it's gonna i, I mean so they're they're making they're making expansive laws to include lots of situations including ones that have nothing to do with their stated purpose and that overreach and the radicalization it's it's like a massive problem massive structural you know problem thanks pete i heard um <clears throat> one of the many interesting articles that came out after alito's leak uh basically said, hey, we should um, find who the father is and basically uh, garnish their wages for life to provide a living environment for said child. And, and you know, there's no penalty here for the men, um, right? And, and so why don't we just, we got DNA testing, we can sort of figure out who the fathers are and make them fully responsible for uh, the comfort of the child. Uh, impractical, dumb, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but, but the, the way I think intriguing. of it, it's, it's, so this is not about the children. It's, 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 it's not pro-children, it's anti-women. And anti-women, I, I don't know if, you, I, I, I know some of you are women and, and I, some of my best friends are women. Women are people too. I don't know if we some of us know, were born from women. can say that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks, Pete. Um, Klaus. Yeah, I watched the Senate debate, <clears throat> sorry, yesterday for about mm -hmm. 45 seconds, then I threw my hands in the air and told about a bunch of idiots, you know, because when you look at the statistical the, the feedback that you get from the general population, you see that two thirds of uh, Americans, 70% of Americans want to have a HO versus, I mean, a, a Roe versus Wade kind of uh, a law on the books. The vast majority, right? But within that, let's say 70%, there are probably 40% that who don't want unrestricted access to abortion. So here's the Democrats, you know, coming in with this, uh, um, pathetic uh, uh, vote, you know, that gives the, the, the Republicans an opening, you know, to say, well, I can't vote for this because you know, it allows a fetus, a, a living, or a, 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 um, what do you say, a viable uh, fetus to be aborted in the eighth month, even until, you know, just before abortion, before birth. So, I mean, the, the list of reasons of, um, uh, undesirable um, uh, the types of, of abortions, and thereby completely wiped out, gave the Republicans who voted against or <clears throat> here an excuse to say, well, I can't vote for that. The majority of American people are against that, and they're right. You know? So this is a political fight, and you, and you have to structure it in a way that uh, you, you, you're swinging with where people really are in this place. So rather than putting this bill up with an opening to say, you know, there, there has to be a, a, a period of time, like in Germany, for example, uh, the, the, it's 12 weeks, it's three months. Yeah? And after that, you need a, a medical certification to say that there are medical reasons to terminate uh, the, this pregnancy. In most countries, most uh, every European country, there are limitations on this abortion. It's just like in Israel, you know, you have limitations on, on, on abortions, but there are, there are ways around it. And by not, by, by not anticipating, you know, how the Republicans would, would move against this vote and how they would position themselves. You know, we are basically voided this phenomenal opportunity to put Republicans on the spot to, 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 to vote, you know, the, <clears throat> Uh, against or for it. So I, I, I mean, these are the, 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 I mean, the inability of the, of the Democrats and liberals to fight right, in, on, on the same terms as the Republicans do, who are masters at this game, is just so painful to watch because it's just, this is just one topic of many 
where they completely don't pay attention. This is like you know, pattern mind, right? You have to step back and see what are the patterns here? How do we insert ourselves into this web you know, in ways that we can swing it into a direction where we want it to go? So that was just, I mean, I, it's just, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad this thing broke. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if several of these Supreme Court judges are glad this thing is out because it helps them to either legitimize you know, this, this opinion that, uh, that Alito has come out with or to modify it in ways that avoids the, uh, any kind of fracture. And, and uh, Schumer just gave them a perfect uh, opening you know, to, to, uh, to publish this opinion as it is written and move on with it. So that's, that's you know, to me, the, the most frustrating part here. Thanks, Klaus. Um... I didn't study the dynamics of the vote that was held, so I don't, I don't know that I follow necessarily the logic that this locks in what happened or whatever. I think they were trying to pin down Republicans as all clearly voting against, or, you know, the law, et cetera. There's a bunch of things I don't fully understand about the, the process there. Um, Stuart and Doug. Yeah, uh, I'm with Doug. Uh, we need to all go back to the monastery. Um, these conversations, even the conversation that we're having today is just, um, it's making me a little crazy um, that we're so fixated in some ways on, on, on fixing the, the so many different problems that, <laughs> that, that it's just impossible to, I'm feeling impossible to see a way through, um, except for, you know, in some small ways doing what you can in the small environment where you live. I don't know if anybody here follows the, the great um, mystic uh, Richard Rohr, but he had a beautiful uh, uh, um, um, column this morning. I'll get it and, and put, put the link to it in the chat, um, just about love and, and how that is so missing in the world. And when somebody mentioned Alito trying to punish men, trying to punish men, um, it's such crazy Old Testament stuff. And, and if you think about uh, where it is in terms of, you know, the world we're living in today, um, we as human beings have created all of these crazy problems with the systems uh, that, we, that we have created and the thinking that we've created. If you look at the demographic of Congress, well, no wonder they came out like this, right? There's a bunch of old, white, <laughs> gray-haired men that are making these decisions. And, and they're not acting from places of wisdom, they're acting from places of, of, um, of partisanship. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, Doug. Sometimes the way to solve a problem is to see that it's part of a larger problem. And I'm thinking about abortion as being on the borderline between nature and technology. And we need to learn to navigate that border in a much better way. My view is, I think the stats are right, that about 80% of abortions terminate pregnancies that were entered into in moments of lust and love. And that that's really important to see that, that the shift from that moment to the abortion moment is a very difficult path and maybe we can just do better. Uh, there's something just deep about the abortion problem that goes to what's nature, uh, what's society, what's the proper use of technology, uh, what's responsibility, what is the role of culture, end of thought. Thanks, Doug. I'll add in here that, um, let me just screen share for a second. There was a, also a really interesting thread uh, after the Alito this, uh, leak that US abortion laws trace back to racism, that, uh, that this story goes back to Bob Jones University versus the United States in 1983, where the IRS revoked their tax exemption because of racism. And um, that event flipped a lot of evangelicals into politics. Before then, they couldn't be convinced to get into politics. They were like, no, 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 that's politics. And then since then, uh, clearly they've become really uh, political. So here's a, here's a tweet stream that somebody wrote that starts, how did, it, how did abortion become the most divisive and politi politicized social issues in modern American history? 
It all dates back to a series of Supreme Court cases that in fact had nothing to do with abortion at all. And he points to Runyon versus v. McCrary, Bob Jones, Brown v. v. Board of Ed, uh, and uh, I think that's it. Um, but I think there's a... Can you know, I just enter a quick comment here? And please. that is abortion has a deep history. All, all, I think all native cultures have ways of doing abortions and do. Right. Um, and so there's, there's an interesting question here about illusionism or magicians where, you know, the idea is to make you look over here at the, at the hand that's moving while something else is going on elsewhere. And there's, there's a piece of this that's, that's horrible. And there's a piece of this that's a, distract, a strategic distraction, I think, at the level that we were talking about just moments ago. Um, and we're not anywhere in a situation as a public, as a citizenry, to be holding those conversations in any depth or meaning. Um, and we need to be. Like th these are really important conversations to not let escalate and explode. And it, it feels to me like there's a bunch of actors in the arena who are busy like pouring kerosene on the issues and using bellows as hard as they can to make sure that this thing is incendiary because that wins elections. And elections are power and power lets you go do more stuff. Uh, maybe a bit of a cynical view, but, but I think it's important where we, where we put our attention. And I'm really interested in how we diffuse the situation so that we can come to more rational solutions for the issues at hand together. Um, let's go back to our queue, which at this point is uh, Grace Klaus Stewart. Such elegant diffusion of the subject. Such elegant what? Diffusion. You said, how do we diffuse it? Like, oh, all right, here we go. Change the topic. That, that works. Well, nobody stood up to jump back into that thread, and we'll be back to it, I'm sure. So I figured let's go back to our uh, check ins. Yeah. So um, I. Over the last few weeks, I've been traveling, working on my uh, OGME thing. I got COVID. I had to end up canceling the event. Um, I wasn't very sick. It was just, you know, the politically correct thing to do is to quarantine. Um, so that I didn't quite pull off that first uh, weekend game, but I still have a lot of people enthusiastic about it. And so I'm looking at reformulating it. Um, and then um, I started talking to some people who I want to co-found stuff with, as I mentioned, and um, that was my next step. And I'm sort of finding myself drawn into something bigger. And it was interesting because I was listening to the Lionsburg call uh, on YouTube to try and figure out what in the world Lionsburg or whatever the meta project is. And it seems there's a lot of that, like there's a lot of feeling that we're being pulled together into something bigger, which is, um, for me, it looks like um, a bunch of small experimental projects, which is what mine is, but with a group of people who are doing similar experiments and sort of a, uh, a collaboration on new economics experiments. And I'm, I'm saying people, but really I'm looking mostly at women leaders who are rethinking economy in very different terms. Um, which I think has a lot to do with even the previous topic in some ways. It's like when, when pregnancy and raising children are intrinsically a part of your life, then the idea of fixing the economy with more work doesn't look like a great solution at all stages of life. So, um, so it's a really interesting group of people and we're starting to kind of uh, coalesce around what are the, what are the, what's the framework for what we're working on. At the same time as I was listening to the medical, um, uh, I don't like that name. <laughs> it's like, like a little bit pretentious. The pretentious project, as I was listening to the pretentious project call, um, and as I was looking at, I actually was, I actually got a note from the Emerge. I'm going to be going to the Emerge conference in Austin this year, and they had published online the names of all 200 of the participants, and I was just it just it seems like this movement is incredibly naive at, about privacy and security and this week as crypto is doing really really badly you, you know whether you 
you know, whether that's affecting you personally or not, or whether you have a lot, you know, like the way that crypto and DeFi looks or not, it represents an alternative movement. It represents a bit of a resistance to the existing financial system in many ways. And to see it be so vulnerable to, you know, whatever it's being vulnerable now, right? Like it's just a mess. And there's so much more organized and so much more privacy and security oriented. And they're, you know, they're cyber, cyber punks. And, you know, they still are in this really vulnerable situation. And it frightens me that we're working on all of these digital projects with no thought at all about security, privacy, identity, and our vulnerability as a movement. And as we converge into something bigger and as we find each other and we overlap with these groups, it seems to me more and more important. I mean, we're doing the opposite of what, you know, Al-Qaeda or terrorist groups or, you know, resistance groups really want to do, which is keep things secret, um, keep people's identity secret, keep people safe. And I worry deeply about that. I, I I think it's naive to say we're going to deal with that later. And so that's, that's something I've been thinking. I'm not an expert in that, except on a superficial level. I've worked for a lot of security companies. I understand cybersecurity from a vulnerability standpoint, not from a, you know, like, how do you write the tech? You know, when we're looking at all this, I mean, I was in Spain and the whole thing with the Pegasus spying stuff was in the news all the time. I just think. I think we're really missing that part in this movement and that we need to start thinking about it at this point, not later. And, you know, discord groups and it's like discord is fully censorable. And yeah, it's something I really think that as a movement, we need to start thinking about more is how can we protect ourselves? And I really, I'm really the last one who wants to spend any time thinking about it because again, it seems like any moment that we spend thinking about protect, protecting ourselves is a moment we're spending not building that lifeboat. But if that lifeboat, you know, can just be punctured with a little pin, it's not much of a lifeboat. So um, that's Grace, Grace, thank you. This, I don't know if this is an accurate analogy, but it feels a little bit like some of the people who are inside crypto using crypto and all that are relying on the anonymity of crypto the way that soldiers in some countries rely on having been blessed in blood, which makes them immune from bullets uh, and death. And it turns out that's not so true. Um, and, and so it, it feels like uh, there's a bunch of people who think that the, the mere structure of the crypto economy is going to preserve uh, them. And that turns out not to be working so well. Then there's a bunch of other people who are just like, hey, information's out and not not worrying enough about it or not worried about it. But I don't, does that sort of fit some of what you're saying? Well, I mean, I think there's stupid people everywhere and, you know, people with, you know, whatever, totems and shamans and, you know, their favorite shirt and all that stuff. But um, I, I don't think so. If you look at the recent Bitcoin conference in Miami, the tone was very much, we know it's war. But I don't think they knew how stupid they were saying it out loud. I mean, you can listen to Peter Thiel's speech, which I was like, Peter, man, you got to watch it. But a lot of these panels were like, it's us versus them. Look what they did to Russia. Look what they did to the truckers in, in uh, Canada. And it's like, we don't have any sense of, you know, of, 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 of what should be secret and what shouldn't actually and where you should keep your mouth shut. As the January 6th investigation is discovering. Um, Pete. Thanks, Grace. Um, uh, in, a, in a meeting of uh, the new Mapweavers group, um, which has some relationship kind of to Flotilla and some relationship to Meta Project, um, I brought up Grace's concern as one of the things that we should be watching about. And I started talking and it made me realize that as somebody who used to do stuff before the internet came online and then was part of getting the internet online for people, um, I've literally been thinking about security and privacy and, and, and the common sense around that since, you know, for 30 years. Um, and, and so I was saying that, um, I don't know if all y'all, you know, kids on the internet um, no, but, um, and to be fair, a lot of the kids are actually pretty savvy about privacy and, and security and things like that. But 
it's it's not obvious that you you know that when your participation online is has has a lot of it leaks into a lot of places technically you know um and so i used to tell people because before the internet people had no idea you know people were used to postal mail and and newspapers and and being fairly secure in your privacy um, i used to tell people getting on the internet um, hey don't say anything on the internet that you don't want to exist forever because it's going to exist forever and don't say anything on the internet that just because you're not in front of a police station doesn't mean that you know what you're doing is not going to end up in a police station or at the fbi office or the cia um, don't say anything on the internet that you wouldn't want your mom to hear and it used to be that people really didn't know the technology and you know they were getting into this new space hey my mom's not here the police aren't here the fbi isn't here i can say what i want and i have, i used to tell people don't think that because that's not the way it works but I, you know, so one of Grace's points was we're making to to just to make our make it easier to work together. You want to make a list of a directory of you know who you're who might who you might work with, um, and that's making it easier. But it's also making a targeted list of you know if um, the uh, the FBI or the CIA, or actually, I just was reading today about uh, people who pretend, you know, people who've broken into law enforcement databases, bad guys pretend to be good guys, and then they end up with a bunch of stuff that, you know, I, there's, there's a bunch of leaky ways that information gets out that people don't really know. And Grace has got a really good point when you start to concentrate stuff together and assume that everything is good um it's you know you you miss you miss a lot of potential harm that can happen if the regime changes or if laws change or if bad actors pretend to be the good guys or whatever right there's a lot of a lot of it happens a lot so i i don't know exactly what to do with that and i guess part of my point yesterday when i was telling this to the map weavers is like i've i've actually lived with that thought you know, it's it's possible since my email's out in public and since I, I make myself public and I put a lot of my work into the public, it's possible that that will attract attention that will end up causing somebody to dox me or somebody to swap me or something like that. Uh, and it's not something I want, but it's also something that I've thought about and I lived my life in a way that, you know, I... I, there's a there's a potential threat that I know about that I worry about that I kind of cushion myself about, and not everybody has that um, in their life. Um, so thanks, Grace. I think we're kind of in the opposite situation now, where a generation of people have been raised that they know that everything that they say is going to be saved forever, and so there's a numbness about it and a and uh, like helplessness about it. And I feel that helplessness. And I think there's tremendous value in creating a um, sovereign, to use Pete's phrase, that they're really here to protect us. Like I would like somebody like in one of these groups, a little team that's the IT and security team that says to me, hey, here's the best phone you should be using. Hey, move everything to Keybase. Hey, um, we scanned your computer for you and you know, like, I think there's tremendous value in us creating a sovereign that would take care of that stuff. That is the place you go for that. You can pay them and it's worth a lot. And it's just kind of the, you know, not the visible fun work, but I think there's a real call for that. And that as a group, we can definitely find the resources for that. Thanks, Ray. I, I like that idea too. And it also kind of, um i it um it's a it's a challenge um it's a challenge to stay safe it's a challenge to educate people that that they need to stay safe i also it reminds grace talking reminds me that earlier she said we we have a lot of digital archives a lot of stuff online that you know we've now we're now we don't have offline copies of that so if things crash you don't have you know a bunch of stuff that's true also of social the the social network that you have um, so if the internet were to go down tomorrow, which is a possibility, um, I would not be able to contact most of you and vice versa. So another thing to think about. 
including backup plans in such case. Um, let's go Klaus Stewart Wendy. Yeah, I'm probably as exposed as anyone uh, when it comes to uh, what I'm working on and how many groups I'm working with and on an international level, right? But I believe in radical transparency. I think it's completely useless to try to, to stay uh, uh, hidden or uh, prevent your information from leaking out unless you want to flow something up, then that's, that's a different thing. But uh, um, the most difficult thing really is to illuminate and make transparent issues uh, that need some kind of resolution. And um, my, my, uh, my thought here is that this, this pattern mind is actually, you know, the, uh, a, good, a good reminder of um, looking at, at the system as a system and understanding it as a system and the interrelationships within this system. Because I'm, I'm working right now on the farm bill, right, with a number of groups. You know, one, one group that I'm trying to mobilize here is the Sierra Club. And it's, it's not easy because you have uh, one group that focus on vegans, one group is the anti cavo group and the anti grazing group. And so you have you know, a couple dozen groups who are working on minutia of, um, of a system, you know, where they see what, I mean, where, you know, I mean passionately engaged, you know, really hard to move uh, into a different direction. So when you, when you say, look, here's a CAVO, concentrated animal feeding operation, if you want to reduce that, then one way to do it would be to stop subsidizing corn and soil, which acts as feed for, for, these, uh, uh, for these things, and then take away the subsidies they're getting, and that makes that meat more expensive. But then you need, also need to have an alternative supply, right? Well, that means you have to build a decentralized meat processing capacity because it's not there. It has been systematically dismantled. But when you do all of these things, then you now need to worry about the farmers who are losing their markets, the soy and, and corn farmers. So then you need to find a program for those guys to maybe convert their land back into grasslands and, and raise cattle on grasslands. So just to, to help understand the systemic implications of making a change in a complex adaptive system. Right? And you could apply that to the abortion case. Right? I, I mean, when you look at where the population is, where the statistics are, it's, it's, it's all readily available numbers. Now, then you can insert solutions that, that, that hit the above 50% range of people that you need to convince. So I, I, don't, I don't know that um, we need, I mean, you don't want to be stupid about putting things uh, on, on, onto the web and say things that are uh, obviously uh, physically threatening to anyone. But other than that, the beauty of the American system is that we can't just spout off and talk about stuff. I mean, I would have been long arrested in China by now, right, or in Russia. But here we can, we can uh, say these things, and that is the power of the system, right? That, that you, you are able to express your thoughts and your ideas. And if you get enough people to pick up on it and, and, and see the logic of your argument, if there is one, uh, then you can move stuff you know, and, and, and build this future that everyone is interested in. So for me, security is like, yeah, that's a tough, I mean, I don't even want to think about it. It's a, to me, a complete distraction. Yeah. Thanks, Klaus. Pete? Um, thanks, Klaus. <clears throat> and I don't want to disagree. <laughs> I, I believe in radical transparency and democracy, yay. Um, the failure mode is in five years or 10 years, we have a government like, like China or like Russia. And um, whoever, whichever bureaucrat wants to give people hell that day finds a list of, you know, dissenters um, and just runs down that list. And, you know, it looks like this group here is a good list to make hell with, right? Um, I, the other thing is, as tensions rise with this radicalization in the U.S., um, it's, uh, it's really easy to be, you know, a semi-public figure like some of us are and 
for somebody on the opposite side to go, well, today is the day I'm going to dox and swat Pete. Today is the day I'm going to dox and swat Klaus. Today is the day I'm going to dox and swat Jerry. So FBI comes to your door, orders you out of that house, grabs up all of your, your electronics gear and drags it to the you know, drags it to their office, never to be seen again. Um, uh, not that I think that's going to happen, but it's also not outside of the realm of possibility, right? And then going through your emails and stuff like that, and, you know, having them decide what your emails mean to them or about abortion or about which is now, you know, potentially illegal. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I, I, I like to live my life that way too, that um, I, I kind of can trust the system, but the system is a fickle beast and it's getting fickler. Um, and uh, we could all be in deep shit pretty easily um, for the things that we do here. Agreed, unfortunately. Um, Stuart and Grace. Yeah, I don't know where we are if we're checking in or discussing security and privacy or what have you. Uh, we're, we're following a, a windy trail. It's a little bit like you. those, like, <laughs> it's a sequence of oxbow lakes tucked under by subway passages. Great. But, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, a few comments. Um, I want to be where Grace is, you know, uh, riding on buses and going to cafes and eating ice cream. I mean, just... <laughs> Especially in, especially in the in the in the mood that I seem to be in today, which is you know tilting at windmills. I wanted to uh, uh, as as um, uh, as Grace was talking about you know having some omnipotent force um, making decisions. I thought about well maybe the Christian Christian right is correct that we need to be following one God who dictates everything. And then everything will be simple and easy, and all of these decisions we're talking about uh, won't won't matter at all. Um, if only if everybody would fall in line, sure. Right, exactly. Which yeah. in some ways is 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 congruent with some of the writing that I've been doing in terms of you know how can we fix all of the all of these pieces that that we all uh, uh, step on you know once in a while. I wanted to comment on on on. Um, on Wendy's thought about not understanding the point about abortion being at the border of nature and technology seems like it's at the borders of patriarchy, politics, and religion. I think it's not an either or. You know, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I remember doing some exploration. <clears throat> this was in the, <clears throat> pardon me, late 1980s. Um, about some of the decisions being made about science. When you think about, I mean, the genetic engineering is, is one thing that comes to mind. All of the stuff around, you know, uh, uh, um, farming also comes to mind. And these are, quote, godlike decisions. Um, and I'm not sure what the status and state of all of those things are, but, um, you know, given the politics around these things, I don't know that they're they're uh, um, being aired um, effectively. I chose not to write about it and dig into it, but I was looking at it from a legal perspective at the time, and it was kind of mind blowing about the kinds of decisions that we would have to be make making as a as a species. Thanks, Stuart. Um, Grace, then Mike, and then uh, Stuart, you're next in the queue, so we'll be back to you shortly. Yeah, so just shortly to Stuart's comment about wanting to be where I am, I cannot recommend to you people living in the United States highly enough to get the fuck out. Um, I happen to have done that 30 years, but I actually did it again five years ago because the way things are, I'm just a scared person. So that also connects me to what Pete said, who said, I don't think any of this stuff will happen, but it did happen. I mean, from the Canadian truckers' bank accounts to the coffee shops that even gave them food and bank accounts being shut down because people were on a list of the resistance. Just, you know, a few miles north of you folks, for those of you who aren't in Canada on this call, right? I mean, it happens from people being thrown off of Twitter and Facebook for showing dissenting views. It's happening constantly. So I don't really understand... Um, the caveat of, I don't think anybody would do that. It's happening, it's happening now. It's just, just right in front of our faces. And I think 
uh, we just need to say that that's what's happening. People are going down lists and some of them are the media and some of them are the big social media platforms and some of them are the bankers and some of them are politicians. And they're just like, they just, you know, it's pretty serious. Thanks, Grace. Um, Mike? Thanks, I apologize for being an hour late. Uh, I have a conflict every other Thursday. Yeah, you have a standing call, so thanks for being here. Yeah, but uh, ironically, we finished the last call talking about how five years ago there was this mantra, well, it couldn't happen here, you know, couldn't happen here. And as you say, it's all too possible. But I, I wanted to challenge the group uh, to put things in a more optimistic direction. I'm uh, helping organize the Internet Governance Forum USA. Uh, the global IGF is going to happen in Ethiopia in November. It's under the auspices of the UN. Our little group attracts about 500 people and another 500 online. And we look at sort of the US take on what's going on in the global internet. And, and a lot of the right people debating the decisions that will shape what's next, whether it's the metaverse or Starlink or big data and machine learning. Really exciting conference, but we've decided to look at what gets in the way of embracing emerging technologies and what can be done to kind of open the door to as many new opportunities, new technologies, new business models, new services. And so what I'm looking for is people who can talk intelligently about visions for the digital future both in the US and out, outside the US. In the 90s, there were all sorts of visions. I mean, I mean, I worked for Al Gore, he was promoting the internet superhighway and the digital library of Congress. Other people talked about the celestial jute box and Apple spent millions of dollars making some really cool ads about doing what we're doing right now, right? In 1995, they had these ads showing you sitting on a park bench, having a video conference with your family. We don't have anything quite as simple now. And so I'm looking for people who can both have utopian visions and not so utopian visions and use those secrets to the future, those, those ways to, to motivate people to push past the barriers that are getting in the way. And so that's, that's my challenge. If anybody has good names of people, particularly people in the DC area who might be able to show up in person, that would be awesome. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge. Uh, we're, we're actually doing two pieces. We're doing one looking back and looking at the visions of the 90s and the early 2000s and several, science, several tech journalists like uh, uh, Dan Gilmore and John Markoff are excited about being part of that. But I'm, I'm focused on the in-person event, which is gonna be July 21st in Washington. And I, I need people like you, Jerry. <laughs> you did a great job last year. We did a, a scenarios exercise looking at how the internet could break apart. Mm -hmm. Now we're looking at scenarios and visions of how these technologies could really make a difference. And, and we're, we're, we're a little unfocused right now. So we, we, we are focused on how it will make a difference for individuals rather than corporations or governments, but we, we're not sure which technologies will be most important. We don't want to have people coming in and doing five sales pitches on five different technologies. We want somebody who brings the pieces together mm -hmm. just like we did back in the nineties when we said, okay, we got better graphics, we got better bandwidth, we got wireless, you know, and, and, and we've got data storage. How does it all come together? So that's the challenge to the group. You don't have to answer now, but if you have any ideas, please let me know. And the more provocative, the better. And the less exposed, the better. Less exposed meaning? Uh, in surf not, is not, always on our list, but yeah, yeah. is always on everybody's lists. Gotcha, exactly. So not the usual suspects. Um, okay. I'd be very happy to help uh, think about it. I'd be very help, happy to show up if, if uh, my perspective helps. Why don't we sort of talk about that? Um, 
anybody else, uh, feel free to jump in. But also, I wanted to point out, uh, Ken Homer had a great idea uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I sent you an email. I'm not sure it, it, you caught it. We'd love to host a pop-up call where you talk about what the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, which is, seems to be in the peace business, uh, thinks about the current situations and so forth. If there's a way to, to, to generate something like that, that'd be really wonderful. I, I, I could do that and probably bring a couple other of my colleagues in as well. That'd be phenomenal. I apologize. I was first I had COVID and then I was traveling on the West Coast and taking care of family issues. Oh, thank you. We did, um, a, it, did a Zoom wake for my uncle. So it was. Oh, yeah. wow. Um, and it appears now that the majority of the U.S. population has been through COVID. It's like 60 percent uh, is where the meter is at this point. So there's a minority of, of people who haven't haven't suffered from it somehow. Yeah. Well, I caught it the day I got my second booster. So I am now three quarters. Three quarters of my body is antibodies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your 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 one trillion cells are now mostly COVID, COVID antibodies. Um, yeah. So thanks thanks Mike and, and, and really good questions. Like like I had a I had a really interesting call with Corey Doctorow a, a little while ago, uh, kind of asking him because I really love his eye on the world. Uh, and and with your new haircut and your current glasses, you're looking an awful lot like Corey Doctorow right this very moment. Well, I'll put my other glasses on and I'll go back to looking like Bill Gates. No, oh, there you go. No, this is a good look. Um, but part of what I was asking Corey about was, hey, who do you follow? Who could I follow to figure out what's going to work in the future? Like, like who out there is assembling a working system that's good for us? And I, I we sort of hung up the call and I didn't really necessarily have answers. Um, so I, I'm interested in sort of going back and lather, rinse, repeat on the question, because I think it's really, it's a crucial question of the age. Um, Doug, I, I just I, to answer your question yeah. in one word or yes. two words, Sandy Pentland. Yes. At MIT, <laughs> he's got a book out. You can there's a free draft version you can find. Uh, it's called uh, Building the the New Economy. And some of the chapters are better than others, but oh. his chapter is really good. With Alexander Lipton and Thomas Hardjono. <clears throat> I've got both, a. Both of them are worth following as well. I've got an essay I'll paste in the in the chat uh, by that title, which I guess is now turned into a book. The other one is. Um, oh no, this is actually about the book. This, uh, yeah. Sorry. The other one is uh, Irving Vladosky Berger, my former boss's boss at IBM. He's sort of a grand cyber philosopher <laughs> and a technologist who understands what he's talking about. Interesting. Um, thanks, Mike. Go ahead, Doug. You are muted. You'd think I would learn. <laughs> uh, the background assumption to what you're discussing seems to me to be holding the profit world and the growing economy as the default uh, scenario. And uh, it seems not, to me that in that's in di direct competition uh, with the fact that more economic activity is bad for the climate. Um, yeah, I think those are some of the underlying assumptions that really matter. And Grace is busy working on what does a post-money economy look like? <clears throat> I had a great conversation with, uh, I had a catch-up call with Janelle Orsi recently of Selk uh, in o Oakland, and she's working on the same sort of question. Uh, I think that we have to question all of our assumptions in that sense. And then we also, I think, have to be it, it's all theories of change at, at social scale, which are like all over the map. But you know, people won't cross a, a raging river unless they see other people cross the raging river safely. And so, what do the stories look like? What uh, what are the examples? What is the scene on the other on the other shore uh, of the river? Um, those are really really important things. And if you can paint a vital, exciting scene that you'd want to be part of. That is like half the deal is done. And I, I want to scroll back. This reminds me of a thing I put in the chat earlier and then forgot about, which is, hey, if we live inside of a complex adaptive system, what sorts of things do we need to do to allow our system to adapt complexly, but then guide itself towards some kind of safe landing for all of us? Because the, the command and control ways of trying to turn this ship are, not, I don't think, going to work. Um, so, so we, we need to figure out better guidelines, better, uh, better 
incentives, ah, I hate that word, and, and, and I don't mean monetary incentives, but better ways of, of directing people's motivations, intentions, and behaviors that work, that likewise accept and understand all of the uh, roadblocks in the way that are some of the things we mentioned briefly in passing, which are laws that were passed that are really hard to move, uh, strange deals that that basically usurp the commons or block people from doing that stuff, all, you know, all kinds of other things and, and active distraction measures. So, um, Doug, did you want to go back to that or? No, I'm done. Okay. Uh, we have a few more people, but only 15 minutes uh, left in the queue. So let's go Stuart, Wendy, Julian. Maybe if Mike had a reaction to what I said, that would be good. Well, I did work for Al Gore for uh, nine years. So I do know a lot of the people who are thinking about the new models for the economy. I, I guess I, I fully agree that you don't measure success by GDP growth. But I also think that the technology that we're talking about here can uh, create a lot of new ways of running a more efficient economy. So rather than you know generating another million tons of plastic, we'll find ways to do without the plastic. Um, I, I think in general, though, I, I am a somewhat of a free market guy and I, uh, somewhat of a cyber libertarian. I do believe that the uh, only way we get to a new reinvented economy that's much more carbon neutral is by spending money. And, and we, need to make, we need to make huge investments. And some of it might be in nuclear power. Some of it might be in space-based energy. There's all sorts of crazy ideas out there, some of which aren't so crazy and could work, but they're all going to require some money. So the idea that we're going to close down half of our economy doesn't get us to the right answer, I don't think. This is the river stones that I'm sort of talking about. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the, the I, I, when I was working for Gore, I mean, it was, it was always this tug and pull between the people who were whispering in his ear on environmental issues. Half of us were saying, hey, these technologies, they're, they're going to give us new answers. They're going to give us ways to radically change the way we do things. And then the other people were whispering in his ear saying, well, we've got to tax the hell out of the existing systems. We've got to discourage economic activity. You know, if we, you know, growth is a bad thing. And, you know, that, that was sort of where he was stuck between. And luckily more and more, he's been t talking about the good side and the positive side, you know, the, 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 and, and we are seeing some amazing things happen. Uh, solar energy being the best one. Just yep. incredible, incredible reduction in the cost of making giga, uh, megawatts from uh, from solar. Two cents per kilowatt hour. Um, the only time I've stood in front of Al Gore to hear him speak, his first question was, I don't understand why I can't convince conservatives that green is a huge business opportunity. That was his first sentence. It was like he was off and running with that. Uh, Ken? Yeah, Mike, uh, I was really glad that you say we might have to invest in nuclear power because that's been a challenge for me. I've been anti-nuke since I was a teenager, and, and I've recently come to realize that in terms of building a bridge from our current economy to a new economy, nuclear is probably going to be part of the equation. And um, I, I keep going back to um, McDonough, uh, McDonough's article in The Atlantic back, I think, in 1989 of the Next Industrial Revolution, where he says, we have two metabolisms on the planet. There's a biological uh, metabolism, and there's an industrial metabolism. And the idea isn't to stop being industrial, but it's to close the loop so that nothing from the industrial metabolism that's toxic leaks out and, and contaminates the biosphere. And that to me seems like an amazingly rich and wonderful and imaginative realm of how can we do that? How can we, how can we instead of saying we have to stop growth, it's like, let's grow the right things. Let's, let's find ways to, um, to, I adhere to that particular vision. And I'm just wondering from your perspective, Mike, since you you know, you're, it, are who you are and work where you are, are, are there people like thinking about that? Or is this just kind of gone to just drive them away in the wind? What's, what's up with that? That is a model that is so outside of the normal vision of strategic thinkers in Washington. I mean, it, it, so, I mean, part of it is because we have a whole lot of people who are lawyers 
who always start with the precedent <laughs> and ask, Thanks, well, Stuart. <laughs> what do we have? What do we have that's going to uh, going to apply to this new future? And the assumption is that this new future is just built on the building blocks that we have today. The idea that we're going to grab some new building blocks or the idea that we're going to somehow redefine the fundamental structure whether it's government or the way corporations are organized that that is that is just it's almost always rejected as well that's just too hard that requires too many people to 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 as jerry says it requires too many people to jump across the stream all at once before anybody's proven it's even possible but so now, I, but now I, and then. I, I i'm being a little cynical and and, and pessimistic but I, I there's very few countries that that really ask themselves how can we change things at a fundamental level? And the, about the only ones that do it are the ones who are rebuilding after a catastrophic war or a great, great, great depression. Mm -hmm. Iceland. Does that help? I mean, Iceland, yeah. you said Iceland? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Iceland completely re reworked Iceland their economy. Estonia. Iceland and Estonia are, are examples that come to mind. But again, that's, you know, that's, that's uh, in, in the case of Iceland, it's less than a, a third of a million people have to jump together and Estonia, it's a couple million. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Mike. Let's go. I, I did put an article in the, in the, uh, a book by Rothkoff. I think I've sold that book before, but it's a uh, great questions for tomorrow. And it gets at a lot of these, these, these great questions that we're exploring right here. Um, he doesn't have the answers, but he has great questions. Um, thanks, Mike. Let's, uh, Doug, did you want to jump back in? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mike, uh, the, the utopia in Silicon Valley is the merging of large data, big data, with artificial intelligence to manage the world uh, with a platform that's owned by the people who own the wealth now. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the things are going to happen that are going to break up that uh, effort because the world is going to be increasingly messy and we should be responding to that rather than continuing to think that the kind of economy that we've had, which is uh, the stock market and technology uh, running together is going to be over. Well, I, I, I think that utopia is one that a small people, a small group of people share, Peter Thiel and the likes. But I think there's a lot more people that look at a utopia where we're all empowered, data is distributed in a lot of different places and can be combined in creative ways as needed by a lot of people. So kind of a, you know, AI as a platform that would serve the needs of millions of different businesses, not five businesses. Yeah, but who owns it? That's the point is it's like the original internet from 1990. You had all these little local networks, institutional networks, a few regional networks that tied them together. And uh, the ownership was, was pretty widespread and a lot of the players were nonprofit consortia. And that, that, could, that could happen now. We could have a distributed cloud. We don't have to have Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM controlling the cloud. Oh, I forgot, I forgot uh, Baidu. Um, <laughs> And we can, we should never forget Baidu. I mean, we always, big tech always has about four companies in China that we, we always ignore. Mm -hmm. But I, your point is, is, is a good one. That is a, a narrative that is out there and is getting lots of attention. And um, as an aside, I have to share this. I will see if I can find the tweet, but there was a, a brilliant tweet that said, why do we cover politics like a horse race? We should be covering it like the business page. And, and, and it, was, it was the night that the Ohio primary finished up and it said, today, Peter Thiel in his, invested $13 million to buy the Republican party in, in, in Ohio. And it was, it was just a, a much better way of thinking about politics. Thanks, Mike. Um, let's see if we can do Stuart, Wendy, Michael. Yeah, um, so I say the same thing about um, the, the coverage of the of the of the war in Ukraine it's it's covering like a sporting event I mean it's really interesting what the what the <clears throat> what the media does so um I just want to spend a couple of minutes uh, sharing um the incredible power energy 
uh, um, an intelligence of some Broadway shows that I just saw um, th that that are amazing uh, uh, social commentary in some ways. Um, it, um, play called um, Strange Loop uh, just won the Pulitzer Prize for the writing. It's a story of a, uh, a, a black playwright um, and strange loop is a psychological term for the different loops we have running around our mind. And it was the story of him growing up uh, in the context of, a, uh, he's gay, in the context of a, of a um, homophobic father and a Jesus freak mother and how he eventually uh, shared his story and the six characters behind him that each represent a loop of his own thinking. Uh, and it was a musical almost with the, the, the patois of, of, of Hamilton. Um, talk about creativity, just extraordinary. A play called Girl, Girl from the North Country, which uh, took a story in um, post-depression um, Northern Minnesota, where Bob Dylan is from and used all of Dylan's music reinterpreted and rearranged in a, in a most extraordinary, extraordinary two and a half hour uh, meditation. Um, because when you listen to lyrics of Dylan, you know, what he has to say is extraordinary. And there is, there's a reason that he won, you know, a, 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 a prize. Um, a play called Six, uh, the story about the six lives of Henry VIII, uh, and, and ex six wives of Henry VIII, an extraordinary musical um, <laughs> uh, where they're competing for who had the worst time as Henry VIII's <laughs> wives in musical fashion. And the last one, a play called The Minutes, which is such a wonderful commentary on, on the contemporary world we're in. Uh, Tracy Lett, um, who's an actor and a playwright, and it's a story of the minutes, about the minutes that are missing from a municipal council meeting. Uh, and, and why are the mi minutes missing? Well, because they threw out one of the councilmen off the council because uh, he objected uh, to the consistent and ongoing annual celebration of the town uh, founder and hero uh, who was fated as a, as a great military champion and anyway, as it turned out, his great you know, military prowess had to do with killing an Indian tribe. Uh, and, and so it, it's, it's all about you know, genocide and, 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 and slavery as it's underneath. Um, and just the extraordinary power of, of being in the presence of these theaters and the privilege of it. And the one other thing was also, I visited in New York, the 9-11 um, the Museum which is the most extraordinary uh, uh, creation in terms of a curated museum and just a powerful, powerful piece of art to be inside of. So that's my check-in for today. That mm -hmm. was a hell of a check-in, Stuart. I hadn't heard of most of these plays and they sound really fantastic. Go ahead, Mike. And just to add one more play that was recommended by a colleague. I have not seen it yet, but it sounds fascinating. It's called Golden Shield and it's a techno politics thriller about Cisco being involved with China in building the fire, great firewall of China. Oh my God. Called the Golden <laughs> Shield. And he said it was just an astonishing play as well as being pertinent to some of us. Yeah, that reminds me of the movie a little bit that's playing now, uh, you know, everything and, 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 and oh, yes. rather just very in a, in a very similar, similar vein. Everything all at once. Yeah, yep. thank you. Everything all at once. I've got to see that too. Which is a great metaphor for where we are as a as a culture and civilization right now. Uh, Wendy, would you like to uh, check in? Sure. Thanks. Thanks. What a fascinating conversation today, everyone. Thank you. Um, yeah, my check in today has taken about six different forms as the conversation <laughs> has emerged. Um, so I'm going to try and try and. Um, synthesize it into one particular slice, um, which I think is in response to, to your proposal, Mike, and seeing technology in new ways and visioning it for the future. I feel like what I'm doing now is, is trying to create 
technologies that are a mirror for what's not seen. So the reason I'm pausing and talking about it is because it's hard to talk about because it's stuff that we don't see. But what I'm starting to realize is super important, and I think it's been a thread through the entire conversation, is the processes by which we do things, right? So somebody referred to the glue um, before and having to kind of like, what do we do when we have to take apart when it's the glue that's the problem, right? And so I think a lot of the things that have been built have been built on uh, understandings, beliefs, systems, processes that have been standing for a really long time. And those processes don't, aren't serving us anymore. Um, and I think we can define those processes in many ways. It could look like the way we grow food or it could look like um, the way we, we educate our children or it could look like the way, we, um, uh, the way we heal, the way we choose to heal people. And if we're creating technologies that are uh, coming from those same, um, those same networks, those same systems, then we're creating te technologies in some ways that perpetuate the same systems that currently aren't working so well. So ironically, we need to create a system that creates technology <laughs> that helps support new systems. Like it's like the chicken and egg. And I think this is why it's so hard to do because we're, we're we, the issues we're facing are so huge. We really need technology to help us understand them and see them. And then we also don't have the things that we need to see in order to create technology that's gonna help, right? It's this, it's this weird kind of back and forth. So I'm taking efforts to try to understand those processes better. And the ones that I'm focusing on, uh, it, for me, it started, the project started for me, you know, 12 years ago, looking at uh, trying to figure out how to make knowledge repositories more seen, sets of knowledge more seen. And then that narrowed itself in the last, year and a half to, okay, let's help communities help themselves be more seen. What, what are the communities that are doing things right? What are they doing and how are they doing it? And how can we replicate that? And now I'm down to what's the creative process? What's the unique human thing that we do when we bring something new into existence? What are we doing? Not just when we kind of almost have it ready and everyone gets all excited because they recognize how important it is and how great it's gonna be and they're all ready to jump on. But what's happening, particularly at the very beginning of that stage, where does it come from? We tend to not talk about it and we don't study it and there's not a lot of research around it. Um, so I'm diving in and, um, and, and finding some really interesting um, uh, experiences just in exploring the concept in and of itself. My intention is then, if we can codify something here and there's plenty of information already out there. So it's really just kind of trying to bring it together and maybe expand upon what's what we already know. We can then include it in mapping so that when we're mapping things, we can, we can see this aspect more clearly. And then that becomes part of the greater knowledge repository as well and becomes a way to map, to look at things. I see this, this focus on um, the cycle of emergence, I'm calling it, um, as as at this tiny little aspect, but then again, I'm also taking the meta view on this and going, this is just one process we're not seeing. I think it, I think it's an important one, but there are many. And so, how the process of how we collaborate, the process of how we uh, choose one thing over another, the process of how we um, solve uh, solve for dissension or conflict, right? All of these could be potential. Um, deep dives. And I think all of them require collaborative, <laughs> the collaborative um, interweaving of ideas and thoughts, um, not just something emerging from one discipline or one academic place or one company. Um, so all of these are important. And I know last week I was bringing up the idea of maybe having a new flow for someone, say like Klaus's work for people to focus in on say one person's object, somebody who's already doing a fabulous work in the world. How can people from many different disciplines come together to maybe help that one person in the community advance a little bit fat, advance their thing a little bit faster. Um, that's another uh, opportunity to kind of run an experiment through a new process and see if it emerges with something different. That's what I'm working on. Thanks, everyone. Wow. Um, thanks, Wendy.
That's great. And then you, uh, every sentence you were saying, I was like, oh, right, there's that over there. And then there's this piece over here. And yeah, it's a, it's a delightful stew. Um, uh, Michael, if you want to check in, uh, we can actually take a few more minutes and get most everybody. And you may not be listening to us at this moment, in which case we might be. Oh, no, there you are. Awesome. Uh, you're muted still. There we go. Yeah, I don't know if this will work. I've been bouncing on and off. Um, and I hope you can hear better, me better than I've been able to hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, you're, sounding, you're sounding OK. Oh, good. Um, well, uh, quick check in from, uh, from North Carolina and my uh, grandfather. Uh oh, now, now you are breaking up. You may want to turn, Michael, can you turn your video off and just speak? Uh, all of the many objects that exist um, that uh, a life throws off and, um, and thinking about them in terms of, of of the knowledge repository and the history repository um, that a lot of them should belong to. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot, a lot of that, um, the ability to, uh, it's a, lo a lot of things we've been talking about sort of overlap in my mind about um, one's digital home and privacy decentralization, abortion as an expression of bodily autonomy um, and, uh, and, and privacy, which I wish, you know, going back to the, the, the question of why, why aren't men, more men, more outraged um, about uh, the, this this decision and and this issue, um, seeing that that choice and privacy as they exist in every context um, are not just a women's issue, and you know not just about reproductive rights, and it's just kind of baffling to me that um, that even with the 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 kind of clear the clear messaging, the clear overlap and messaging of my body, my choice with regard to um, vaccination, it's still possible to fool people into thinking that this issue is, is somehow not their issue. It's everyone's issue. And, you know, and it's most particularly an issue for those with any sense of conscience about the way, you know, women are legislated against um, both officially and unofficially. But yeah, I mean, are, are you, are, do you deserve to be safe at home in your own space um, in every sense? And you know, the, 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 the fact that our, our homes and where we keep our stuff can be disconnected from us by an internet outage, as opposed to being, you know, our, 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 our knowledge and selves being under our own control and that we don't have the power to choose who we share information with and don't share information with, just sort of all <laughs> rolls up into one big ball. It's, it's just really um, interesting to hear, hear these these different issues um, come up and think about how they all intersect. Um, so that's where my my head is here in the, the strange environs I'm in. Thanks, Michael. You helped me. Excellent. You helped me click a lot of things together in my head as well, just from what you said right now. Um, we have a dear friend who lives in Denver, uh, who's parents whose father whose last parent passed away a couple years ago and his her father had been a decorated world war ii hero and left a huge number of things 
all neatly marked and labeled. And her task for the better part of, I think, more than a year was to find museums that wanted the different pieces and to sort of donate different, different parts of the legacy into the right places. And it was just this beautiful, and, and she's very diligent and thoughtful. And so just hearing the stories of, of this was, uh, was remarkable. Um, not but actually, of... I'd love to connect with her or, or learn more about what she did just because um, uh, Poppin, as we call him, is a, a, a World War II vet and Korean War vet. And, you know, there's a lot of that kind of stuff um, along with other things. And I think about the digital archive of all that instead of, you know, the museuming so much, but, you know, there's both the physical and the digital. Um, so expect an email, expect an email shortly connecting you with Linda Nelson. Okay. Um, and I think she'd be thrilled to talk to you. She, she doesn't, she doesn't live uh, in the New York area by any chance, does she? Not that I know of. She used to work at Gensler. She was like a, a early employee. Very common, very common name. Just would have been funny. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, she's she's built airports around the world. That was like her specialty. And Gensler is one of the world's big uh, design firms. So, um, thanks everybody. Uh, Stacy, I hope your head feels better. Um, yeah, thank you all for for being here wholeheartedly, and. Uh, See you next week. Let's pick a Jerry. Jerry, as long as we're here, we've taken. Why don't you check in? It was long, unless people have to leave right away, but you have you haven't gone. We'd like to know what's going with you. Okay. Um, <laughs> thanks, Ken. Um, yeah, my uh, so the last month has been like remarkable in my little world. Um, I have some funding to pursue the shared memory thing that I would you know that we're, we've been working on that I'd like to work on and I'm still I'm trying to figure out right now what are the moving parts how does it work uh how does OGM fit the picture because it's a very OGM-y thing and I need to figure out like what goes where um uh and a lot of the, the stuff that we've been doing in pre jerry's brain and other kinds of places fits really beautifully Wendy the tapestry that you're working on and the, the now the emergent framework uh fits um, all these things kind of work. And so um, I've been having some more conversations to figure out also who else is working on this puzzle. So for example, I had a call with Danny Hillis um, and I, I'd never really had a sit down conversation with Danny, but I met him years ago at PC Forum because he used to attend regularly our conference. Uh, he built, uh, he was at Connection Machine way back in the day and then he built MetaWeb, which created Freebase, which they sold to Google and which Google then basically privatized as their knowledge graph. And he regrets that that got taken out of the public domain. And we had a lovely conversation with this really similar kinds of intentions about how do we actually sort of create a public sphere which is more useful and usable. And so their current project is called Underlay. And I was busy saying, you know, I look at your Underlay project and I don't figure out how what I'm doing here with, with the brain and other sorts of tools fits. And he's like, funny, you should say that. There's an Underlay project, there's an Overlay project, which is where tools like that fit. And then there's this Interlay layer, which helps the gears mesh. And we didn't go very deep into it, but I'm like, oh, okay. There are, there are people out there who, who have this intention of creating a generative commons, I think in the spirit that we were talking about in our generative commons conversations, <clears throat> that I would like to go find and connect back in and see if we can't find some resonance where each of these entities is busy building the thing they see that fits where the, the fit in the middle uh, works better. Uh, so I'm sorry I haven't been on the, the circle, uh, the book circle calls or the mapping calls. I need to step back in and jump in. I've been trying to sort out um, all this kind of stuff and it's, it's um, uh, exciting and head exploding. So I'm, I'm, in, a, I'm in a good place and a, a bit more like stable than I was before financially. Um, so um, so we expect to hear a whole bunch more uh, as I figure out how to, how to talk about all this and, and where it fits. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. Yes. Hi. Thanks for asking. Um, and see y'all in the intertubes and we'll go deeper into all this stuff. Thank Ciao. you. Ciao.